We'll cover these first eight verses, which I think are very interesting. I have a lot to say to us. If you're waiting for some big event in your life to take place before doing anything, stop wasting your time. There's a lot of believers that do that. They're waiting for some miracle to drop out of the sky. You know, God knows when we need a miracle, a a bona fide miracle. But that isn't the way that life works. At least that's not the way that life works well for us to wait for some big event before we really uh, do too much. Even if you can somehow convince yourself that God has a miracle waiting for you, heading in your direction, waiting for it is not what he has in mind. In other words, waiting for it and not doing much else. The point is that life doesn't work on one or two or three gigantic episodes. A person's life is not shaped by a singular turning point, but by thousands of days, each one filled with small, unspectacular decisions and small, unremarkable acts that make us who we are. And so it's how we deal with those small things from day to day. That'll have a whole lot more to say about how you are, how you grow as an individual, rather than some miracle uh, that you might be waiting on. People are uh, kind of relates to that, but people are fascinated by magic, aren't they? How many of you have ever seen a magic trick, or we'll say a magic show, okay? You've seen a magic show? What some of uh, these magicians do is absolutely amazing, isn't it? If you've ever seen one, uh, even though you know that it is all an illusion. What's the alternative if, if it's not an illusion? What do you think? Demonic. Satanic? Yeah, demonic? Yeah, that's possible, very possible. Uh, have you ever seen anybody levitate a building? You ever seen that on television? They've had uh, somebody do that. Have you ever seen anybody levitate themselves? And, you know, they had... Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, and I don't really care to remember it. Uh, He's he's big in illusions. Uh, They've had had an episode where he was standing there talking to a group of people, and they're in a uh, covered garage. And all of a sudden, he he starts levitating. And there's apparently no props around and no uh, prep that's taken place. Uh, Some pretty amazing stuff. But the magicians that are honest will tell you that there's nothing magic about it. It's just an illusion, if they're honest. We were in such a show in Missouri one time, and we'd been taken there by some friends. I probably wouldn't go to one on my own, but we'd been taken there, and so the guy was doing some pretty amazing things uh, during the uh, during the show. And at the end, he redeemed the whole thing. He said, I want to tell you that what you've seen during this show, there is no magic to it. He says, it's just an illusion. He said, it's us uh, distracting you or you wanting to see certain things, and so that's the illusion. Sometimes it's the same in our lives. We want something spectacular to happen. But it is finding the spectacular in the everyday decisions that we make that really does make for a quality life. And you find what God is doing in your life from day to day, moment by moment, hour by hour, the greatest miracle of all. We have to learn to appreciate that. You know, if you learn to appreciate those moment-by-moment uh, types of miracles, if you will, or God moving in your life, your life will be very rich. When you read the first couple of chapters of the book of Ruth, you might say to yourself, wow, what an amazing set of coincidences. But we know better than that because luck and coincidences are not the provinces of those that follow Christ according to the word of God. Stop using those terms if you're a believer. Well, I sure was lucky today. Or, oh, hey, what a coincidence. You are basically surrendering yourself to those things instead of saying, I'm being led step by step by the Holy Spirit. Luck is for people that haven't prepared. If you prepare for something great moment by moment, you don't need luck. And you don't need coincidence. You don't need those things. That's, that's for unbelievers. Ruth made a series of decisions that set her on the path for something greater. We've read about it through this whole study. The key wasn't that she was looking for something greater. She was simply making the right small decisions. She was doing the right thing, making the right decisions. So step by step, she was moving towards something greater than she could have ever anticipated. And that's kind of where we're at in the story. 
Most of the world's great achievers would seem like colossal failures if noted in the early going. But they kept going step by step and learning with each decision to go forward. It set them up for the breakthrough that they were looking for, but it happened because they took it step by step, moment by moment. When our family was living in Homer, we attended a non-denominational church. The people there were very friendly, very open to us, but I've got to say I felt like the depth of the teaching just wasn't there. And so I checked out another church in the area that I knew would have a more thorough presentation of God's Word. It was more open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and that is where we started to attend. And that is also where we answered the call to ministry, was in that church. Step by step, moment by moment, we had positioned ourselves for that to happen, Though I've got to admit, I probably didn't think of it that way at the time. I just knew that this church isn't really teaching God's Word to the depth that it needs to be taught, and so we sought something else. If things aren't working out for you in one way or another, it may be that you haven't positioned yourself for the greatest opportunities for success. And that's the key. You have to position yourself uh, for that, and how you do that is through preparation, training, constantly staying at work in the kingdom of God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, and you place yourself in an ungodly setting, you are setting yourself up to fail, or you're setting yourself up to fall. Boaz stations himself in the gate of the city, as these verses depict in chapter 4, because that is where almost everyone passes sooner or later. It is also the place where many of the judicial decisions are made. For the city. It's kind of a gathering place for leaders and for different events that would be taking place. We don't know how long he was there, but according to Ruth 4 1, it seems like it wasn't very long. It says there, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one. He's just greeting him. He's saying, He's getting his attention. Or turn aside, sit down here, and he turned aside and sat down. Boaz shows by doing this that he's a man of action. To Ruth, he has been kind, he's been merciful, he's been generous, he's been honorable toward her, and amazingly concerned for her personal reputation. It's, what is today? Valentine's Day, right? How appropriate it is that we have a a love story between Boaz and Ruth, but more so, it's a love story between Christ and his church. And everything that we see happening with Boaz and Ruth is exemplary of Christ and his church. I'm talking about all of these different things, such as being concerned for personal reputation. Boaz was a complete gentleman. Do you realize that? God is a gentleman. Aren't you glad for that? He will never impose himself on you in any way, shape, or form. He will always be kind, courteous, and concerned for your reputation. So much so that he made himself of no reputation on our behalf. Boaz was also uh, being humble, modest, and he was reserved. He was a gentleman. Now he has made the decision to place himself in a position to settle the issue of who the kinsman redeemer shall be. The Gael, the kinsman redeemer. The great sculptors have been said that, uh, have often said that all they do in taking a large slab of, we'll say, stone and turning it into a work of art is simply releasing that which is already inside. So they're just chipping away what is keeping you or me from seeing what is really there. They're simply taking away that debris so that the real identity can be revealed. Isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly what God does with us. There's inside of you and inside of me is who God wants us to be. And for us to get there day by day, he has to chip away a little bit more of the debris that's keeping us from being those people. Boaz's position and his initiative would reveal who he truly is. 
and it would also reveal who the other kinsman was and his character. Is he named? He's not named in this, is he? The other kinsman? This process required witnesses under the Levitical law in Deuteronomy 25. And Ruth 4.2 uh, talks about it. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here, and they sat down. So he's got a type of uh, court there at the gate of the city to witness everything that was going to take place. Boaz is doing the right thing by the numbers. And that is the same way that you and I must go about our business for the kingdom of God, doing the right thing by the numbers, step by step, checking all along the way. With every decision that we make to do the right thing, we are chiseling more of the sinful debris away to reveal who we are truly meant to be in Christ with each decision that we make. If we do not decide to do what is right, we will never look like God intends for us to look. The more we tolerate sin in our lives, the more our appearance to the rest of the world is distorted. And we have to be concerned, first and foremost, is, is how we look and how we're conducting our lives, is it distorted to God? Even though we may, may be saying, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ, are we looking more and more like that day by day as more and more of the debris is chipped away? There'll be too much debris left to know who we are. It'll cloud our identity, mostly to ourselves. Leonardo da Vinci made notes on his techniques for painting and sculpting. He made meticulous notes. It was as if he was writing a how-to book on how to sculpt and how to paint. He said the key to painting something such as the human body well, you have to have studied uh, how it works. You have to have studied its sinews, its bones, its muscles, and its tendons. Da Vinci said it was then that one painted, uh, what one painted would be seen to have grace and beauty. Da Vinci said without such study, you'll come out with something that looks like a sack of walnuts or a bag of radishes, unless you really study and see how things move, how they flow. You can rest assured that Da Vinci sat down, when he sat down to paint, it wasn't necessary that he go over all that data again that he had collected over the course of weeks, months, or years. He had been studying, he had been practicing, he had been building those critical habits into his life so that they were now a part of him. That was his own process of getting out the chisel and going to work on himself. And you and I have to do the same thing emotionally, intellectually, physically. We have to get that chisel out, and we have to go to work on ourselves. Your life isn't going to go anywhere unless uh, you've got a plan for it. God has that plan. God offers that plan to us freely, without uh, any reservation. It's a plan that takes everything into account, even the type of person that you are right now. He takes that into account. You know, it's, it's amazing because some people find that to be intimidating, that God has a plan for their life. But here's the thing about it. That plan is based on his design of you. He's designed you a certain way, and the plan that he has based on that design is the only thing that will work for you. Everything else is a path to failure. So he's got that plan for us, and it's... It's something, you know, when people struggle with the plan of God, they've somehow missed the point. Or they're lying. Because I've never heard somebody say, I've tried God's plan and it doesn't work. It was telling the truth. First of all, it does work. But the real issue is they haven't really tried it. That's the issue. So they're lying. I've tried God's plan and it doesn't work. It would be easy to sit down with somebody for five minutes and discuss with them how they would define trying God's plan and discover probably five to ten different ways that they really didn't do what they were supposed to do to really attempt uh, that plan with uh, whole heart. Some people find, uh, like I say, a little bit uh, intimidating, but it's supposed to be liberating. 
Some might say that they have their own plan and they do follow God's plan. To, to follow his plan would stifle their identity, would stifle their freedom. Do you think that God takes uh, your plans into account? Do you think he does that? I think he does. Your plans for, well, I want to do this, I have this goal, one, two, three, four, five. Do you think he looks at all of that and takes that into account? Well, I can guarantee he's probably, uh, he would probably tell you if he would tell you now, make your plans. Just make them in pencil. Because the Holy Spirit's going to come along with the eraser and say, that's going to destroy you. That's going to destroy your family. That's going to cause your walk with Christ to be compromised. Here's a better way. Some people need to have the debris chiseled off of their eyes so that they can see clearly. Or maybe a little bit out of their ears so they can hear the Holy Spirit clearly. That's what Boaz, uh, in this case representative of uh, Christ in dealing with the church, but Boaz has a plan that would fit in perfectly with the plan of God. You'll know you're on the right track. When your plans and the plans that God has for you do not come into any conflict, you are on the right track then. If they do conflict, you are wrong. That's not too direct, is it? Because the alternative would mean that God is wrong, and God is never wrong. So if your plans and his plans conflict, you're wrong. That's an absolute. You can uh, take that one to the bank, if you will. You've missed the point somehow. How do you know if your plans conflict with God's plans? First of all, you know, Colossians 3 really gives us a pretty good way of measuring that. Can you do this thing that you're thinking about wholeheartedly and say, in the name of Christ, I do this? Can you, with whatever deed or with whatever you're about to say, can you say, I do this absolutely and completely to glorify God? Colossians 3.17, Colossians 3.23. Is what I'm planning, can that fall under that sanction? If it doesn't, get ready for a beating, because that will be coming your way pretty soon. Boaz has some personal goals and plans in mind, but he makes sure that they do not have any way of, uh, of coming into conflict with the plan of God. How does he do that? He, he knows what the scriptures say. There's uh, references in Leviticus. There's references in uh, the book of Deuteronomy about what to do in a situation like he has right now where he wants to be the kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth, and yet there is someone that is closer the scriptures also have provision for that. And when you do that, when you take that attitude, that can only lead to good things. Anything short of that will lead to severe disappointment, discouragement, and perhaps disaster. Verse 3, And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. So he's, uh, what Boaz is doing is he's laying out the situation. And I can guarantee you that this other kinsman already knew about it. I mean, the whole community knew that Naomi and Ruth had come back. They knew what their situation was. Ruth's uh, reputation for going out and uh, going through the fields and getting the leftovers. Boaz mentioned it earlier. Uh, we've heard about you and what you're doing. So undoubtedly, this kinsman knew this. Now, if... Boaz is representative of Christ, and Ruth is representative of the church. It's probably not too far of a stretch to say the unnamed kinsman is representative of sin, or evil, or the ungodly. If this kinsman was willing to follow the plan of God, he would have stepped forward prior to this time. But see, this type of situation, as described in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, involved total sacrifice, absolute sacrifice, nothing held back. And so this kinsman wasn't willing to go that route. This means that Boaz was probably fairly certain that this individual would shirk his responsibility. He didn't know for sure, and the other individual had to voice that before witnesses 
before Boaz could act in, uh, on behalf of Naomi and Ruth. And so he needs this to be established before these witnesses. Boaz planned it out well, even though there was nothing deceptive about it, because it followed a biblical prescription in Deuteronomy 25 that everybody there would have been aware of. So he lays it out pretty clearly in these verses, verses 3 and also in 4. I'll read verse 4. And I thought to advertise thee, or to make this known unto thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. Remember, he's talking about it in verse 3 about a parcel of land. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. So the kinsman says, I will redeem it. But he's talking about the land. He's talking about the land. So he refers to that land that the kinsman can redeem and should redeem under the law. And so this is what he says in response to what Boaz lays out. He says, I will redeem it. And that might have ended the issue, but uh, Boaz says, whoa, 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 not so fast. That's my paraphrasing. Not so fast. There's more to it than that. What this kinsman was saying, yeah, I want the goods. But I don't want the responsibility. And that's the difference. Christ taking full responsibility for your well-being and mine. Sin will never do that. Sin will only take what it wants from you and leave you empty and beaten and bruised. That's what sin does. And when it comes to the absolute commitment and self-sacrifice that is involved, sin will say, I'm not going to be there for you. It's a absolutely amazing how many people do not understand the connection between freedom and responsibility. Unless you're a responsible person, you're a slave. You're not free. Sometimes people say, well, I, you know, I want to be free without having any responsibilities. It isn't that freedom requires responsibility. It is that taking responsibility is the only way to be free. It's kind of interesting. We, I was in a position today where one phone call would have saved a family $26,000 by placing one phone call to me. And I made this known to this individual right up front, and I said, I'm going to give you to 12 noon, and if you don't call me, then that's gone. They didn't call. You think I'm going to keep my word on that? You better believe I'm going to keep my word on it. And there are other people's lives that are involved. But it was that one individual that didn't want to take responsibility for her irresponsibility, who didn't want to be held accountable for her ex extremely poor actions, and didn't want to humble herself to make a telephone call that could have saved $26,000. She didn't keep her word. Oh, but I'll tell you this, I'm going to keep my word. And there's no going around that. We're talking about different types of resources here. Uh, Navy pilot James Stockdale was shot down over Vietnam in 1965. He'd been a student of Stoicism and the Roman philosopher Epictetus. It was one of his favorite studies. Epictetus was born a slave and was maimed by his master before being set free. Epictetus was the type of individual that as the story goes, his master was in the process of breaking his leg. And as he's in that process, Epictetus tells him, you're going to break that if you don't stop. And he broke it. And without even uttering any pain, he said, I told you you were going to break it. But see, that's kind of the uh, aspect of stoicism. You take things in a way that is rather even keeled. You take difficulties and even good times pretty much in almost the same context. You deal with them in a similar way. Epictetus said that our suffering almost entirely relates to the way we think about things. 
the way we worry and the way we fear. He said, these are the things that really are the source of suffering. He told his students that we alone are responsible for our happiness because we are free to choose and judge. All of that is very, very true. It doesn't minimize the, the role that God plays in our life in any way, shape, or form because God gives us that ability to, to choose. Stockdale remained a prisoner in Vietnam for seven years. And he en endured some of the most horrific torture described anywhere in literature. He was beaten on a regular basis. He was kept in a cell that was three feet wide. He was uh, tortured and never gave up any information. He end endured enough torture to fill seven lifetimes, not just seven years. He kept telling himself during all of that that how he dealt with it was completely up to him. He said that his captors in torturing him were suffering more than he was. There'd be one strong individual that could do that. Responsibility is the way to freedom because it means taking control of how you're thinking, acting, and feeling, and not putting that off on somebody else. We see this all the time. This individual that I described is just like that. It's always somebody else's fault for whatever's going on in their life. And individuals like that tend to be users. They... They want more and more, and they never really want to take responsibility or be held accountable for their own actions, their own thinking, their own feeling. Taking responsibility takes courage because it always involves taking a hard look at yourself, and that is always uh, a perilous moment, if you will. It does take courage to look at yourself and then to be honest about yourself. Most people are living in some sort of haze or daydream, some sort of unreality about who they really are. Boaz was ready to take full responsibility for being Naomi and Ruth's kinsman redeemer. And for that commitment, uh, or for that rather, it had to be absolute. The commitment had to be absolute, as he points out to his other kinsmen in verse 5. Then said Boaz, this is the other part, not so fast, he tells the guy. What day thou buys the field of the hand of Naomi, which is what he wanted, Thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. So taking responsibility was going to cost Boaz, ultimately, a little bit later on, something, but to him it was worth it. To this other kinsman, his response is, never mind, I won't redeem it. First he says, I will redeem it. Then he realizes the commitment that's involved, okay, I won't redeem it. So he shirks his responsibility which he could do under the law. He could do that under the law. So for this uh, other kinsman, it wasn't that he was uh, related. He was. And it wasn't that he didn't have the resources. He did. The problem was that, uh, that he had is one that many people have. He wasn't willing. You know, each one of us have some sort of relation to Jesus Christ. Each one of us has the mental and emotional resources to make a decision for Christ. The deciding factor is whether you're willing. That's the deciding factor. So once this individual relinquished his responsibilities in front of these witnesses, Boaz makes it clear, he says, I've got the resources. I'm related. And I'm willing. That's Christ. For you and for me. He's willing to do whatever is necessary to fulfill the law and regain that which no, uh, Naomi and Ruth had actually lost. The other kinsman came up with an excuse for not doing the right thing, as we've uh, looked at. He says in verse 6, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself. What's his main concern? Lest I, lest I mar mine own inheritance, redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. He's saying he can't, but that's not really true. He could. He just wasn't willing. We have to be careful with the use of excuses because they are very seductive. It's easy for us to come up excuse with excuses for why we shouldn't do something, for why we weren't somewhere we should have been, or why we were somewhere we shouldn't have been. Excuses are seductive, and really, they're addictive. 
people often come up with an alibi for not doing what they should be doing. If we go the road of achievement, we will quickly learn that they are not permanent. Go the road of achievement anyway. We have to keep moving forward, and there's a type of proving that takes place every day. You can achieve a lot, but you have to show that it's taken grain in your heart and your mind, taken hold, and it's part of who you are now. And so you start, you keep achieving every day. And it really is, the world is kind of like that. It's almost like, well, yeah, you did that yesterday. What are you going to do for me today? When we have what we think is a valid alibi, we are fixed for life, it seems. We are all prone to do this because excuses are a type of protection measure. That's the way that alibis are. Alibis are somehow reasons for why we didn't do what we were supposed to do. And when we start taking the road of the alibi, the, the alibis start taking root in our hearts and in our minds, and that becomes who we are. You know, with, a, with an alibi, with a lifelong alibi, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I'm bitter, I'm disappointed, I'm discouraged. Those are all uh, cheap alibis for not doing the right thing. When we say, those are my alibis for not doing what I'm supposed to do, that becomes the lifestyle. Excuses require nothing except doing nothing. And they always make more room for more excuses. While responsibility is the true path to freedom, excuses free us from responsibility. And yet they also free us from achievement. They also free us, excuses do, from purpose and progress. Now you can be quite sure that excuses and excellence never live in the same zone. It just doesn't work that way. Our setting is so exemplary of the way that God presents responsibility to us. We always have another uh, option. Because another component of true freedom is the ability to choose, which God gives us, even if it is the wrong thing. That provision was made in the law, as stated in uh, verse uh, 7. I'll tell you what, let's look at uh, that passage in Deuteronomy 25. Uh, you might find this uh, amusing, maybe. Deuteronomy 25, verse 7. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, so we're talking about redeeming that which has been lost, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate under the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to taketh up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. So this is kind of where they're at with Boaz and the other kinsmen. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him, and if he stand to it, such as saying, I will not redeem it, or I can't, or I won't, or I'm not willing, or I don't have the resources, or it was more usually, I'm not willing. But if he stands to it and says, I like not to take her or to redeem, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that is footloose and fancy free. Well, it doesn't say that exactly. The house of him that hath his shoe loosed. All right? So there it says that the kinsman that failed to uh, or refused to meet his obligation would face this uh, situation have his uh, shoe loosed and uh, have be spit in the face. And uh, that is where, like I say, we derive that uh, phrase that I use, foot loose and fancy free. And I can tell you that most of the people in this world think that's a good thing, being foot loose and fancy free. Translation, you are not meeting your responsibilities or your obligations. It means you are not committed, you are irresponsible, and you're doing whatever feels good at the moment. That's the vast majority of the world. However, the Deuteronomy passage certainly does not portray that as a way to be. Our world offers us excuses and easy outs for just about everything. And that may sound compassionate in some ways, but it undoubtedly does more harm than good. 
I've shared this with you. This was some years ago. I had determined to give a full scholarship uh, that UAA had granted our school to this particular student. And the mother was very prideful. And she came uh, without the student, who was a senior. I think she was 17 or 18. And the mother came and she said, uh, we don't want it. She doesn't want it. I said, are you sure? I said, did you talk to her about this? Is this her decision or is it yours? It was her grandmother, not her mother. And this scholarship amounted to about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. And because of her pride, because I told her, I said, if you tell me that right now, then I said, that scholarship will go to somebody else. And so she took that scholarship based on her pride and took it away from her daughter, her granddaughter. And undoubtedly that affects, uh, affected her life. How could it not? You know, most students that uh, intend to go to college, let's say you're going to grant me a scholarship for four years of tuition paid. Most would say, I know the parents would say, yeah, that's a good thing. It was a similar situation that I was dealing with today. You know, our kinsman redeemer won't do that to us. Would you, would you say that he scholarshiped us in? Yes. He has. He scholarshiped us in into the kingdom of God, hasn't he? He said, all tuition paid. Oh, it costs something. For you to be scholarshiped in and me, it costs something. He's just saying, all tuition paid by the blood of the Lamb. You know, but when you think about the world offering excuses, sometimes we do that for other people. Well, you know, they're busy. Or, well, they're, they're still hurting. Or they're doing, you know, and, so, and that may sound compassionate, and maybe it is to a point, but in, it undoubtedly and ultimately does more harm than good. It's a, it's not your fault mentality. But that never makes anyone stronger. One of the first things when I'm counseling with somebody is I'm trying to get that individual to take some responsibility for what's going on. You know, very often, sometimes in uh, marital counseling, it's, it's one spouse coming and bashing the other one and saying, he did it all, she did it all. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I don't believe any of that. I've told a couple of people that. I don't believe any of that. You didn't contribute to this at all? See, it's making excuses. That person might as well go ahead and pick up the chain and put the collar around their neck, put the shackles on their wrists and on their ankles, because by saying it's his fault, it's her fault, it's their fault, they are enslaving themselves to the fact that they can't do anything about it. Because they're saying it's all their fault. So I'm going to be miserable because of it. It may not be your fault in one sense, but how you deal with whatever has happened is your responsibility. Boaz, like our kinsman redeemer, never shirked an ounce of responsibility, and because of it, we have come to have personal knowledge of what the word redemption means. Redemption. We couldn't get it. You don't have it. I don't have it. I couldn't get it on our own. Our kinsman redeemer came and expended his resources, showed himself to be qualified through relationship, and showed that he was very willing. Isn't it interesting on that one depiction on the cross here on your outline, the, that nail, and that's more what the nail looked like. They were spikes, really. They weren't really nails as what we think. They were spikes. It almost looks like a chisel, doesn't it? It kind of looks like a chisel. Redemption, it means we lost it. Our kinsman redeemer got it back. And now we no longer need any excuses. Meaning, we are free to strive for excellence every day. And not just to hope for it, but to achieve it. By his example, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we have a pretty good manual in God's word telling us how that can be done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father... You're so good to us to give us this vivid illustration in the book of Ruth. And what it does is it illustrates 
your willingness to give everything on our behalf. I'm not really sure that Ruth, representative of the church, in fact, I know she didn't. She didn't really have anything to offer Boaz. She and Naomi were destitute. Yet he says, I'll expend everything, and I'm willing to expend everything on their behalf to redeem what they have lost. And so you have said to us, we don't really have anything to offer you, but you said, I'll expend everything of who I am to redeem what they have lost. Lord, we thank you for that provision. How amazing you are to do this for us and to give this probably the most graphic illustration in all of your word of what it means to redeem. The word redemption, what a glorious word that is that you provided us. Lord, I just pray for each person here. You know what their burdens of the heart and mind are, what they may be struggling with, and Lord, those are real. But you offer real solutions if we just bring them to you. So Lord, I just pray that it's a moment-by-moment, step-by-step process sometimes that we're going through. Help us, Lord, to not be waiting for some big miracle. If that happens, that's fine, but but to see every moment as a miracle of walking with you. Help us, Lord, to always equate our freedom to the responsibility that goes along with it. Lord, thank you for every person that's here right now. You know the needs of those that were unable to make it, Lord. Just uh, touch them where they're at. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.